welcome to the So Say We All, The Flame. Thanks, Sebastian. Thank you. Thanks so much for bringing the elements to be out, with us, uh, out here with us this evening. My name is Joe, and I'm the producer for tonight's show. I've been associated with So Say We All for about six years, and I performed at the last month's FAMPS performance. Thanks. Tonight, we are proud to present Anastasia Zadike, Kirsten Hernandez, Ona Russell, Dallas McLaughlin, Roberta Canto, J.M. Brown, Nubia Chavez, and Leslie Ferguson. Roads are closed. Schools are closed. The sky is the color of dirty peach sherbet. The sun ringed in blood orange. A county vehicle drives down our street as slowly as an ice cream truck, playing not a sing-song melody, but one of those loudspeaker recordings, usually reserved for end-of-the-world movies. Something about evacuation not being mandatory, but strongly suggested. Followed by the ominous words, This will be your only warning. And though the fires that have been burning for days have not yet reached our neighborhood in Solana Beach, a little cluster of homes on a double cul-de-sac tucked near the San Alijo Lagoon, we've heard the flames have taken properties abutting the lagoon itself. The air, normally host to a marine layer of fog, is so dry it sucks the moisture out of our mouths and noses and skin. Our lungs are tight and our nerves frayed. We are aware that one wild spark and the kindling rich open space that stretches from El Camino Real inland all the way to the beach could become a horizontal column of fire. We are not so foolish to believe it cannot happen to us. We know people that have lost their homes and everything in them, furniture, rugs, books, wedding rings. We also know that if we evacuate, we cannot take everything with us. We can only take what will fit into two cars, a Prius and a Honda Odyssey. Friends who'd faced mandatory evacuations east of us and come to our home only hours earlier are in the driveway, planning their next move. North, up the five, before it can be shut down, before we all become trapped between the fire and the ocean. I think we should also leave, but my husband isn't convinced evacuating is necessary or prudent. There's only one way out of here, I remind him. The Kindling Rich Lagoon not only presents a fire risk, it also cuts off our escape to the north, as do the train tracks that run parallel to the 101. And we won't be the only ones trying to get out if things get worse. Yeah, he says, but they might not get worse. An evacuation isn't a panacea. We could get trapped on the highway or up north in a hotel. There are fires up there too. He's right, anything could happen. The unknowns far outweigh the knowns. I bring up our daughter's asthma, how breathing is hard for me and my lungs aren't compromised. Maybe you should go with the kids and I should stay, my husband says, like Brett. Our neighbor's in the backyard, hosing down the hillside behind his house. His wife and kids have left, but he's decided to stay, to fight the fires should they come. I try to imagine being far away, knowing my husband is in the line of fire, or the reverse. No, I say, whatever we do, we're staying together. He agrees, but within two minutes, we've already blown this vow and split up. While my husband and son spray down our backyard, and my daughter looks for a hotel up north that will allow cats, I drive up to the nearest fire station to seek advice. The firefighters are all away fighting fires, but there is a woman at the station desk. She advises us to leave, recommends we remove any propane tanks that might be near the house, she says the warning about the warning being our only warning was really, truly our only warning. Driving home, my thoughts dart and flicker. I recall how as children, my siblings and I used to mold hot wax that dripped from candles adorning the dinner table, slicing our fingers through the flames like flesh sabers, licking our fingertips before snuffing them out, feeling that little snap of burn, literally playing with fire. I think about how just yesterday, one of the families from our school that lost their home sent an email asking everyone to search their photographs for images of their children at birthday parties and school events so they would have something to remember them when they were small. 
how one of my daughter's friends, when pressed to grab what would be hardest to replace, grabbed his retainer. <laughs> how decisions made in the heat of the moment can often be faulty decisions, that mistakes lead to other mistakes. So I hurry home, and while my husband and son fruitlessly hose away, watching the water evaporate from the soil as soon as it hits, my daughter and I begin gathering the things we decide we cannot live without. Our earthquake box, filled with prescriptions, contacts, and a wind-up radio from KPBS. Pieces of art, boxes and boxes of photographs. My daughter's retainer. We pack suitcases with favorite clothes, shoes, and jewelry. We pull the kids' stuffed animals from the top shelves of their closets and grab small collectibles, sentimental stuff. My husband and son abandon the watering and come around the front of the house to help load the car, and my husband asks me to pack up his grandmother's china. You mean the gold rim china we never use? I say, honey, the longer it takes us to get out of here, the more likely it is we're going to get stuck in traffic. As I say this, though, I notice tears in my husband's eyes. He's not a crier, so I assume it's the smoke. Until he says, she didn't have much, and that china was the nicest thing she owned. I hadn't been aware that for him, this was like the collectibles and stuffed animals valuable for the memories evoked. So I hastily put together broken down boxes from the garage and packed the china we never use. My husband places these boxes into the back of the van and our kids climb into the front passenger seats, our son in the van, our daughter in the Prius. The sky has darkened, ash is falling. Time slows and speeds up simultaneously. My daughter uses her inhaler, coughs, uses the inhaler again. We need to go now. The cats are meowing ceaselessly in their carrier in the back of the Prius, and I think about animals' sixth sense about natural disasters. And then I remember the propane tank in the backyard, and I envision it exploding, the house burning, coming back to nothing. And I wonder if humans have a sixth sense, or if I'm just overreacting, falling prey to the strangeness of this situation, the surreality of a red sun and gray flakes falling from the sky that just might represent the remnants of someone else's can't live without. I tell my husband about the propane tank warning, and he goes to retrieve it, then loads it into the back seat of the Prius as I lock the door to the house. My eyes go to the sky, and the neighbor standing on the hillside, a long green hose in his hand, an arc of water falling to the earth. I shudder, and my husband says, the chances we'll lose the house are very small. I nod, but I know Mother Nature is random. When I was a child, a tornado swept through our Midwestern neighborhood, striking every other house on the opposite side of the street, a hopscotch pattern of destruction, a roof here, windows there, an entire wall blown away. Fires can work the same way. I take one more look at the house, and then clutching the keys in my hand, I get into the Prius, put my foot on the brake, and press start. Within minutes, we are stopped in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic on Lomas Santa Fe, heading toward the visible traffic lot that is the five. TV images of people driving through flames flash through my head, accompanied by a newscaster-style voiceover about the impossibility of outrunning a fire. I look over at my daughter and think about my son in the van, and I regret our indecisiveness and wasted time. All I want is to get them someplace safe, and right then, my husband phones about sticking together and dropping the propane tank at Dixie Line, and I wish we'd left the tank behind, and distracted as I pull into the Dixie Line lot, I drop the keys I'm clutching, and they fall to the floor under my feet. No matter, I think, as long as they're in the car, it will keep running. It isn't until we're back on Loma Santa Fe, trying to change lanes to head north along with everyone and their brother, that I remember the keys are loose, and for reasons which escaped me then, and escape me now, I reach under the seat to find them, and when I can't, I look down for just a second. And with a crunching sound, the forward motion of the car ceases. I look up to see that I have driven into the car in front of me, crumpling the back of it inward, and within a nanosecond, I realize it is my own car, the van I drive every day. <laughs> the van in which the boxes of China are loaded right against the now crushed hatchback. I've just driven one of our cars into the back of another one of our cars in the middle of evacuating from our house because it might burn to the ground, and the tension I've been holding inside explodes. 
I'm out of the Prius crying, oh my God, repeatedly interspersed with, I'm sorry. (laughs) My husband meets me where our cars are well beyond bumper to bumper. Honey, he says loudly, stop. His hands on my shoulder, he adds in a softer tone. Don't cry, it's just a car. Well, two cars. When I don't laugh, he goes on, we're all on edge. These things happen. Remember that time I drove the car into the garage post? I nod. That was just a normal Saturday, he says. (laughs) He hugs me. I love you, he says to the top of my head as someone honks behind us. In the end, we spend two days up north, all four of us together in one room, six if you count the cats, glued to the news, trying to follow the fires burning here, there, everywhere. We talk containment percentages, defensible spaces, and structures threatened. We watch videos of heroic firefighters silhouetted against infernos, families picking through rubble, flames looking at the edges of roadways. While we are away, they do close the eight and the five for a while when brush burns on each side of it up near Pendleton. The fires do not breach the highway near our home, however. When we return, it is still there. There is a film of ashy dust on everything. We unload the possessions we thought we couldn't live without. Ironically, a few years later, our home is burgled, and many of these very things are taken, never to be seen again. The jewelry, the art, the collectibles. And once we recover from the initial sting of loss, We move on. The dishes, unstolen, sit under the kitchen counter, unused. (laughs) The van is long gone, and we no longer live in the house near the lagoon. What remains is the story of the fire, the silvery orange haze, the futility of watering down a hillside, the smell of smoke, me driving one of our cars into the back of another one of our cars, a hug in the middle of Loma Santa Fe, and being reminded of something that in our hearts we knew all along. The only things truly irreplaceable were not packed in the back of the crumpled van or the bashnode Prius. They were sitting in the front seats. It was the summer of 2016 as I prepared to go into my sophomore year of college, and I was pretty excited. I had finally started to make friends in college, I felt comfortable in my studies, and I had finally recovered from having to flee the dorm I shared with my Christian cultist chicken nuggetarian roommate the year prior, which (laughs) is a different story. (laughs) Ever since Arriving home for the summer, I felt such a strong urge to come back to school because it felt like I finally had my shit together. I had things I actually looked forward to, and one of those things was the sorority I was vice president of. As someone who had the fragility of, well, an 18-year-old, I felt so much validation being part of this group. Among these women, I often felt like a Mrs. Potato Head parody of the look that they were trying to accomplish, but that summer, they had chosen me to be their leader. Me, their brown-skinned, chunky, size 10, nerdy little sister, was seen as someone important, (coughs) someone worthy. I wore the same letters as girls who looked like and often were models. I went to parties with enough weed to make Snoop Dogg weep. And I hung out with fraternity men whose looks were in the 99th percentile, even when their SAT scores were hovering around the 25th. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, I was that bitch. (laughs) My dad had driven up with me to Long Beach to move me into our new sorority house. Now, conjure up the image you have of Greek life housing. You probably see mansions and grand staircases and pillars holding up their bright pink walls. Great. Now that you have that image in your head, think of whatever the fuck the opposite is, and that was our house. (laughs) 
We had a crack stucco, no AC, no front door locks, bars on the windows, and royal, royal shag blue carpet featuring vomit stains left from our former frat boy tenants. Even by I just ate Easy Mac seven meals in a row standards, it was a little rough. Even so, I was going to make this place something to be proud of, because even though it was shitty, it was mine. I moved into the top unit, the nice one with a balcony providing views of the polluted Los Angeles sunset with my best friend and president, Tara. We spent the day in a frenzy, decorating our barren living room with Target throw pillows, Ikea furniture, and storage units with secret compartments to hide our Malibu rum. My side of the bedroom was covered in what could only be described as nerd shit, including my last week tonight with John Oliver poster, BB-8 figurines, and a new set of Game of Thrones direwolf stuffies I spent way too much on <laughs> at Comic-Con that summer. You would spend $80 on those little shits too, don't lie. Her side donned solely Avatar The Last Airbender memorabilia. We named our unit the West Wing and we would have had Aaron Sorkin quaking in his boots. I really had to convince myself not to hate my new dwellings because in one week's time, I had to sell the dream to 500 girls going through Rush. Now, for the literal uninitiated, Rush is a three-day dog pony show where women who want to join a sorority dress to the nines in order to impress the current members of each organization. Each day has a theme. Uh, the first is introduction day. The second day is where they lie to you about how much they love doing philanthropic work. <laughs> <laughs> and the third night is fancy night where they use macaroons and mini cheesecakes to manip manipulate you into telling your life story. It was $75 to rush, but the cost for our chapter to host it was the equivalent of a few years worth of tuition. I later learned we spent about $14,000, including taking out loans to take part. All of this, they said, was justified as startup costs for our new organization. And after wondering about the specifics of how we racked up a bill like this, I soon found out. The day after move-in, the whole chapter met in a lecture hall on campus to meet with the consultants of an organization called Fired Up, a group dedicated for a large sum of money to helping Greek chapters have a successful recruitment. Now, I don't want to show their logo and get sued, but let the record show that this was fired with a PHI, you know, because Greek letters, it's so cute. <laughs> Everyone knows that being a participant in Greek life requires some financial privilege, but the private industries and consulting firms that prop them up are multi-million dollar entities themselves. And I was really eager to find out what this price tag bought us. After sitting on our 70s style swivel chairs for several minutes, fired up consultant Marlene from upstate New York burst through the side door with the enthusiasm of a Christian church camp counselor leading an impassioned anti-masturbation chant. <laughs> Before so much as an introduction, she began leading us in the Obama era call and response, fired up, ready to go to which our members enthusiastically obliged as if half of them weren't going to vote for Donald Trump in months' time. <laughs> Just minutes later, the mood shifted quickly as Marlene, in conjunction with our alumni advisor, Jessica, an Orange County soccer mom likely to be wearing wedges on a trip to Target, <laughs> began berating us for not preparing to have a successful recruitment. We were accused of not caring about our looks, not making enough personal sacrifices to rebuild Zeta in Southern California, and told us that if we didn't step up, we'd become Jeeves, a slur for non-Greek life students. <laughs> That's a <the> thing. <laughs> the cherry and whipped cream on top of the shit Sunday was when she compared our chapter to the World Trade Center on September 11th. She didn't think that was at all hyperbolic. <laughs> and the afternoon only got worse when it was time to model our recruitment outfits on a makeshift runway down the lecture hall. I zipped up my specifically blush pink dress, strapped on my nude exactly five inch wedges, and worked my ass down that runway like I owned the place. After a few cheers from the crowd, Jessica stopped me and patted my stomach. 
and asked me, what are we going to do about this, huh? <sighs> Giving me a gentle shove back down the aisle without waiting for a response. Not wanting to give her the satisfaction of seeing me cry, I stood up a little bit taller, shimmying my way into the back corner, hoping to God no one demanded anything more of me for the half hour before afternoon break. For lunch that day, I and anyone else above a size four was given half a sandwich and sent away. Fatties, Jessica told us, don't get a whole one. The comments about my weight and everything else were just how humans operate under stress, I told myself, and it would be wrong of me to judge them for that. They loved me, but they just wanted what was best for all of us, and after all of this, things would be going back to normal like I wanted them to. Tara and I spent the week leading up to Rush running errands, getting things out of storage, and picking up more consultants from LAX and a Chipotle catering order, which they conveniently forgot to mention they hadn't paid for. Uh, side note, if anyone wants to know how much extra guac is for an $800 order, it's one of the things I know now. <laughs> it was part of our executive duties, Tara reminded me, and we should be proud to do it. And it was reassuring to hear that from her. On the morning of our first event, I threw on my blush dress and did more errands. The chairs in our cemented backyard were set. The rented event tent was propped up to protect our guests from the SoCal August heat, and the guests-only lemonade was mixed. All of the members were downstairs propped in the door, prepared to ambush the rushies with song and dance about how great it was to be a Zeta. As they moved through our lower level and into the backyard, we launched our heavily rehearsed rotation of conversations, one by one meeting girls who were wearing the same outfits and the same goddamn things to say. So what are you majoring in? Comms. <laughs> okay, what do you like to do for fun? Watch The Office and go to Disneyland. Okay, well, you mentioned you like traveling. What's the coolest place you've gone so far? Las Vegas. <laughs> After five conversations and what was only the first round of 10, I was already exhausted. None of these people were people I wanted to spend time with, let alone all my time with. We were told to avoid the three Bs, boys, booze, and bama. How could I get to know someone without talking of anything substantive, their ambitions, their relationships, and the issues they stood for? Even as my fake smile stood stiff, my inner dialogue of denial began to crumble. I somehow still managed to write the pit feeling in my stomach off as hunger pangs from eating half sandwiches the last week. Each round of rushies ended with a house tour where we showed our guests the living quarters. Tara and I led my small group of girls up the stairs, teetering in the wedges I fucking sucked at walking in, into the West Wing. After showing our crew the living room, putting extra emphasis on the target throw pillows for some fucking reason, I opened the door to my room. And as my hand on the knob extended, I paused, blocking the view from everyone behind me. My bedroom looked completely different than the one I had left that morning. I instantly felt my stomach churn, a stabbing anxiety penetrating my heart. Rather than a full wall of posters and pictures of loved ones, they lay bare with the exception of some generic sorority wall signs that weren't mine. Our bedspreads were changed to be uniform, and even the clothes in our doorless closet were replaced with trendier ones in smaller sizes. All signs of personal affect were gone. As I stood taken aback, Tara mustered up a few uninspired positives about the room having brand new furniture. Walking out, she shot me a death glare, not the what the fuck kind, but rather the knock it off variety. We took everyone through the rest of the house and waving goodbye, sent them to whatever sorority they were off to next. In between rounds, I ran up to my room, dodging the multitude of alumni watchdogs so I could frantically look for my belongings. I found some in the hallway storage closet and some in the cupboard, but most I found crushed in the corner of my bedroom, shoved between the wall and the dresser out of view from anyone taking a cursory look. My old bedspread sat on top of nearly everything else hidden in sight. My crushed posters, 
sat bent and ripped at the bottom of the pile. Some of my glass figurines snapped in two and the direwolf collector's box dented. Jessica appeared in the door, fuming as I sat on the floor with tears beginning to involuntarily run down my face. What the fuck is your problem? Get downstairs. Why did you do this? I asked. I didn't look her in the face. Are you serious? You're an adult. Stop crying over toys. Jesus Christ. She said, stomping off downstairs, muttering to herself. I turned the corner to exit, and I saw Tara sitting on the couch, avoiding my gaze. I thought I was their leader because they saw me for who I was, all of what I was, and liked me for it. But I stood there, though, looking at the physical evidence of that being a lie. I wasn't seen as a good leader. I was seen as malleable, a little girl who would bend over backwards to be accepted. As the day went on, having the same conversations dozens of times, I realized the girls that I was interviewing thought that I wanted them to be a certain way too. I joined this group to gain acceptance for who I was, but instead it was on the basis of who they could make me. It was then I lost that passion and that pride I had just a week prior. The only motivation I had to stay was the lease. I was too poor to break and the shitty bars on the windows meant to keep others out also stood as a reminder that I was being kept in. Maybe the $14,000 we spent was a waste because instead of getting fired up, I flamed out. That was Vamp, first timer, Kirsten Hernandez. And of course, Ona, rest assured, I will acknowledge you profusely. Wow, I thought, what an honor. My dissertation advisor had just told me I might recognize a few of my ideas in a conference paper she was delivering at the Western American Literature Association's annual conference. My ideas. They were original, she said fit perfectly into her argument about the mythology of the masculine West. She smiled in her charming maternal way. I've been swamped. Time got away from me. But don't worry, I didn't copy you verbatim. I left her office in a cloud. I could envision the audience members mesmerized, hanging on her every word, as they always did. Would she ask me to stand, point out the specific ideas that influenced her own, note the cleverness of the title she'd appropriated? Whichever, I was humbled and flattered profusely. That it was Professor X, as I shall call her here, who shared this news with me made it all the more heady. X was a woman on the rise, a brilliant, bold, irreverent instructor on an unobstructed path to tenure. From X, I learned that literary value, like beauty, was relative, was in the eye of the beholder. X taught me that everything, the entire world is a text, subject to interpretation. She expanded my lexicon, demonstrated how words like problematize and subjectivity could help strip away the veneer of high art. She illustrated how female writers, that damned mob of scribbling women, as Nathaniel Hawthorne called them, had been silenced, how the literary canon was perpetuated by an all-powerful patriarchy. Men, goddamn men, they were the culprits, she said, individualistic, rigid, linear setting the standards, relying on phallic-centered formulas, determining value by the muscularity of the prose. We sisters, she claimed, were forging an alternative narrative. Herstory was the newly coined term, a resurrection of suppressed voices, writing predicated on connection, community, and mutual respect. And I was all in. Embracing the premise 
that in addition to their overlooked talent, humans with vaginas with two X chromosomes were more evolved, kind and just. Women put society over self, were bred to look out for each other. In physique, Professor X was large, big boned as they say, a comforting presence. A former Mormon who'd left the fold and challenged the status quo. She'd moved from Utah to San Diego and was instantly adored. She had charisma, that intangible quality that can be used but not cultivated. I was enamored with her intelligence, in love with the attention she showered upon me. A few of us, her favorites, lunched with her, were invited to her home. To us, she was a model, a heroine, an Amazon, a warrior with a heart, antithetical to the Jeff Bezos of the world. The conference was in Vancouver, and I'd brought my teenage daughter, Brooke, along for the trip. I was a returning student, a soon-to-be holder of a PhD in 19th century American literature. It had taken me years, many more than most of my younger colleagues, to reach this goal, and I wanted Brooke to see a little of what I'd worked so hard to achieve. The day of the talk, we arose early and got a good seat, two rows back from the dais. I glanced around at the packed room, giddy with anticipation. I tried to catch X's eye, but she was reviewing the paper, the textual melding of professor and student. The crowd quieted, and she began, speaking the title that, but for the elimination of a word, was the one I'd struggled to create. The sign of the cross, church, state, and sex. Mine had a triple before cross. I waited for a glance, a nod, but none came. She was engaged, lost in the event. Or was she? Because for a moment it seemed as she did in fact see me, but pretended she hadn't, her usually bright eyes briefly going dead. My heart skipped a beat as she continued to read, co-opting my approach analyzing a Western novel through the overlapping triad of church, state, and sex. I recognized my ideas all right, but this wasn't just influence. No, it was more like a takeover, a body snatch. I felt queasy, scribbled a note to Brooke. Holy shit, that's mine, that's really mine. Yes, I scribbled those words a modern day member of Hawthorne's damned mob. Brooke picked up on my alarm and scribbled back, what? I tried to calm myself. Wait for the end, I thought, wait. The profusion would come then. But a creeping cold told me otherwise. Thank you, thank you everyone, X said, clapping, smiling, chair shifting, taking a bow and departing the room. I was confused and dazed, wondering if I'd inadvertently given her permission. X was a model of integrity. It must have been me, I thought, asking for it. After the panel, I bumped into her in the elevator where she casually noted how wonderful it was that colleagues could borrow from one another without anyone making a fuss. <laughs> huh? Did I mishear? Was I losing my mind? Were those eyes even really mine? Again, I doubted myself. Maybe since I'd taken her courses, I was just simply regurgitating her words. My daughter was as troubled as I was by the incident, a double whammy since I'd imagined the experience as uplifting. I spent the remainder of the trip trying to explain to Brooke what I couldn't yet articulate. Eventually, I would come to understand those feelings as betrayal, violation, and abandonment. Feelings which were as much about the model of feminism X had championed as the immediate act of plagiarism. For X, and as I would come to learn many others of her ilk, theory was one thing, practice quite another. 
a hard lesson that ultimately left me cynical and disillusioned. For weeks afterward, I said nothing, and neither did she. Victim and victimizer. X had taught me about those roles, the male and female version, that is. Victims blaming themselves, victimizers looking outward. And so it went with us. We went about our business, me still questioning my sanity, she holding court, her divinity shining brighter every day. Time passed. I decided to put my head down, down earn the degree, and get the hell out. But people like X are never satisfied. They must continue to be fed. I realized the day I happened to notice an announcement in my mailbox that her paper, that paper, our paper, had been published in a prestigious academic journal. And that's when I came back to life, when my blood boiled over. First, I confided in a friend who recommended I talk to my other female committee member, which I did. And I was hopeful until she leaned in and said, Professor X has had a hard time lately, Ona. Then I knew the fix was in. Look at all she's done for you. She continued, you owe her. She thinks of you as a daughter. Gut punch, cognitive dissonance, a blatant display of the kind of manipulation both teachers had associated with patriarchy. Again, I thought maybe I was crazy. But as one by one the ranks closed, as the matriarchs whom I trusted bore their fangs, I began to understand that sisterhood has its limits, that a vagina is secondary to power. Still, I didn't stop. I wrote Professor X, confronted her in a letter. She responded first with an apology and then gifts, postcards, books, and finally, with a retraction, stating that the ideas had actually been hers in the first place. I spoke to the men on my committee, who looked at me blankly. I went as high as the department chair, another woman who responded with veiled threats regarding my degree. I could see the writing on the wall, and it was in bright red ink. Time passed, and I passed. My orals, that is. Although Professor X remained on my committee, the literature department agreed to my demand that she be removed as advisor, a small price to pay in exchange for the silence they essentially forced. Toward the end, I learned from a colleague I confided in about another student who had a similar experience with X. We talked, compared notes. The details were confirmatory. But this person had been hurt beyond repair tragically quitting after completion of her degree. I'm sorry, before completion of her degree. I have no doubt that there were others who suffered X's bite. As any good predator, she handpicked her prey. She targeted the naive and the vulnerable. I was both because I was inherently trusting, a bright and shiny object she nearly irreparably tarnished. And her superpowers never waned. She borrowed additional works of mine, interestingly involving mythic frontier outlaws, Calamity Jane, and Deadwood Dick. She surmounted the plagiarism charges, becoming chair of the department herself. This after I answered a university survey rating my professors, one that assured me of confidentiality and encouraged me to be honest. In my response, to my two-page account, I received this response from the Dean of Graduate Studies. Why didn't you bring this matter to light before? There aren't any ongoing issues. Indeed, she was identified as one of the most effective members of the department. In other words, we don't believe you, and even if we did, we'll make your life miserable if you take this any further. They say revenge is best served cold. I say it's best served in a novel, my novel, The Natural Selection, written and published several years later. A historical mystery, 
about the murder of an exalted college professor and the faculty members <laughs> who put their fragile egos over the needs of their students. The book was a California Book Award finalist. And I sent a copy to the literature department, <laughs> making the revenge all the colder. In my story, <laughs> in my story, the she is a he, a brilliant sociopathic XY. But since X also taught me about the fluidity of gender, maybe, just maybe, she'd be proud. That is Ona Russell, everybody. Uh, to the West Lou and Matt Hoyt. <clears throat> About a decade ago, I attended a friend's second wedding. I only bring up that it was his second wedding because I had been the MC at his first. I had one of the better lines at the reception when I welcomed everyone into the very nice hotel's very large ballroom by saying, welcome to the 2002 Independent Spirit Awards. One person laughed very loudly. The second wedding was very different. It was held at a boutique hotel. The ceremony was by a pool, and it had a theme, Mad Men. There was no MC this time around, but there was a 90s cover band made up of my two best friends. One played guitar, the other cajon, and they actually were pretty successful around San Diego for a few years. They called themselves Fever Crotch. <laughs> the bride and the groom had gone in on a date to see them play and then asked them to play their reception under a different name, of course. The wedding was short, and the reception was a damn delight. There were dessert trays everywhere. None of this wedding cake bullshit. Appetizer stations and, of course, an open bar. Which, by the way, if you don't have an open bar at your wedding, fuck you. You're a bad person. Please understand that outside of your immediate family, no one wants to go to your wedding and see you get married. No one. The only reason they're there is to get free drinks and free food. Please don't be an asshole and make people pay for drinks. And don't have a dry wedding. A dry wedding, holy shit. Unless, unless, and a relative of yours died of alcoholism. And even then, it's a toss-up because, I mean, they're not going to fall off the wagon. Anyway, this wedding had an open bar. And I took full advantage of that. Fever Crotch asked me to come up and sing Bust a Move, which I'm very good at, like uncomfortably good at. When I was done, I walked over to grab a tower of desserts. When I was approached by the photographer, who was also an old friend and I hadn't seen in a while. We chatted for a few minutes and she asked if I would check out her photography page on Facebook. I said I would, and later that night when I got home, I did in fact check out her Facebook page. I'm a mad man of my word. After a few minutes, I kept noticing this one girl who was in a lot of the photographs. And naturally, being a single 30-year-old man at the time, I began the process of Facebook stalking this girl. And here's the thing. This girl was beautiful, like a model beautiful. And that's probably because she was a model. <laughs> I've always been one to punch outside my weight class, which at this point could be described as Taco Bell. But at this moment, even I was like, hold on, champ. She's out of your league in the sense that she's on the field playing the game and you're in the nosebleeds and you're not a person, you're a seat and you smell like beer farts. <laughs> so like all men of legend, I messaged her blindly. And then like a moron, I asked if we knew each other. She replied saying that she didn't think so because of course we didn't and she wasn't an idiot. <laughs> However, she said she noticed we had some mutual friends and then accepted my friend request. Things were happening. I immediately messaged the photographer from the wedding and asked about this model friend of hers who would one day probably unfriend me. However, I was determined to try. I hadn't dated anyone in three years, and I was happy with that, very happy. I mean, my life was great. I had just come from eating t free tiny eclairs and rapping an 80s hip-hop song at a wedding while dressed like a dying Don Draper. <laughs> Things were solid. But I couldn't get this woman out of my head. This time, something was different. The photographer told me she was a great person and we'd be great together and I should go for it. And I mean, who doesn't trust a wedding photographer? <laughs> the model's name was Samantha, Sam, and we started messaging back and forth, then texting, and I finally got up the courage to ask her out. The plan was to go see the movie Inception as it had just come out. 
At the time, we both worked in theater, which meant we were never available till late at night. So the only time that worked for us was a 10.40 p.m. showing. We got tickets, and the lady at the door told us, you know this movie's three hours long. <laughs> no. <laughs> we didn't know the movie was three hours long. But she seemed fine with it, and I just wanted to be where she was. When we sat in the theater, I went into full-blown performer mode. I was slinging jokes, impressions, whipping out my best anecdotes, doing anything I could to appear interesting. At first, everything was going very well, but then I got nervous. She crossed her leg away from me. That's a sign she's not interested, right? But then again, by doing that, she pushed her body closer to me, so really she wants to be closer, right? Right? <laughs> I began to convince myself that I was screwing it all up. When you're not the best looking guy in the world, you really have to rely on charm. And at this point in my life, I was over 260 pounds, so charm was thick. <laughs> this led to an at times debilitating combination of unchecked confidence and uncanny anxiety. When the charm seemed to have little effect, my anxiety kicked in in the form of a little voice in my head. What is she doing with you? She's beautiful. How old is she? She seems young. You're old. You should get up and leave, but also put your arm around her. <laughs> no! Just save both of you the awkwardness of her rejecting you and leave immediately. It makes no sense that she should date you. You look like all the members of the Shins put together. <laughs> Try to hold her hand. The only thing I did end up doing was actually just staring at her hand for about two hours. I was very slick. We walked out of the theater at about 1.30 in the morning, and I turned to ask how she liked it, and she was yawning. A big yawn. Like a fuck you yawn. <laughs> I was so sure that I had screwed it all up, but after she yawned, she said, you wanna go to Denny's? <laughs> we went and stayed till 3.30 in the morning. We talked about Denny's menu items for way too long. She ordered mozzarella sticks, bold choice. I think I ordered just coffee, because when you're a bigger guy, anything you put in your mouth is questioned. <laughs> we talked about our lives, our jobs, our futures. Of course, we'd already been doing this for weeks on Facebook, but now, now it was real. I could actually see what made her laugh, what made her confused, and what made her smile. I could hear in person just how much smarter she was than me. I could tell she was better than me, and therefore, I had to be with her forever. <laughs> a few days later, I asked her to go to Julian with me, and she said yes. A long drive to a small town was a bold ask for a second date, but I felt confident. We walked around all the shops. We ate at the Julian Cafe, where I made dumb characters out of the salt shaker and the creamer. Sergeant Salt and Captain Creamer retired. <laughs> they both tried to convince her to be my girlfriend. Again, performer mode was in full effect, and instead of thinking I was being obnoxious, mainly because Captain Creamer sounded like this, and Sergeant Salt was inexplicably British, she would just laugh. When we walked her out of the restaurant, I went to hold her hand. She declined. I died a thousand deaths. The voice, see, I told you, she hates you. The creamer bit was dumb and you smell like chalupas. <laughs> she said she didn't really hold hands, something I'd later find out was bullshit, but in the moment also definitely sounded like bullshit. I pressed on. We got back to my house and we kissed. Quite a step up from hand holding, but what did I know about dating? A few nights later, she came with me to see Fever Crotch. I got up to sing Bust a Move because I had to prove my worth as a potential life partner. We left the bar and I asked her if she would be my girlfriend. She said yes. Then asked how old I was. We'd never talked about it. She was 21, I was 30. I was old, but she already had health insurance, so it balanced out. <laughs> the voice inside my head would seem to disappear when I was with her. In fact, my mom used to comment that I seemed at ease when I was around her, to which I replied was because of my newly prescribed blood pressure meds. <laughs> the need to overcompensate because of my inability to see good in myself was being washed away because she saw it without any qualifier. We were engaged a year later in Julian, on the same corner where she refused to hold my hand. Most of the people I knew would see us together and marvel at the huge mistake Sam was about to make. 
In fact, most people didn't quite understand how this had all worked out to begin with. And I was fine with that. It's best not to ask too many questions. You don't want to spook the horses. Yes, yeah, she's very pretty. Yes, yeah, she's much younger than me. Yes, I'll die first. That's part of the plan. We planned our wedding for September as we, as we were broke and we learned that that's one of the cheapest months to get married. Who knew? Apparently most people. I was in the middle of nowhere, it, the wedding, sorry, was in the middle of nowhere in the woods, a small venue that warned people not to use any kind of Google Maps or GPS system as it would just lead you right into a lake. Neither one of us were particularly religious, so I asked one of my best friends to be our officiant. He was so happy, he immediately went out and got ordained by the First Universalist Church Dot com. He peppered his speech with lines like, do you, Sam, take Dallas to be your lawfully wedded husband as long as he shall live? <laughs> and compared how much more popular Sam's maiden name was to my last name as a symbol of the significant step down Sam was taking. It was great. Instead of a unity candle or some nonsense, we made a unity iced coffee. And we had our officiant and a woman from the audience sing Almost Paradise from Footloose while we made our unity iced coffee. It was an honest to God blast, mainly because we had an open bar. <laughs> As the night started to come to a close, Sam definitely looked worn out. I started packing leftover beer into the trunk to take to our hotel. Since we were in the woods, we couldn't do goodbye sparklers, and they very much discouraged rice or anything that birds might eat and then explode. <laughs> so we had our friends and family wish us well with a dance tunnel. We're very fun. <laughs> we got into the car, and I immediately got nervous. I was sure I just convinced this woman to make a gigantic mistake. This woman I had met on Facebook, of all places. This woman I had used all my drunken Irish charms to woo. That mean, anxiety-driven voice started blabbering in my head so loud I couldn't shake it. I looked forward to see the dark road lit by stars ahead and cleared my mind as best I could. I started the car and turned to see my newly wedded wife yawning. A big yawn. Before I could inexplicably apologize for what I didn't know, she cut me off and asked, you want to get burritos? Yeah. I did. <laughs> and we did. And that is the foremost authority on comedy, Dallas McLaughlin. There we were in my one-bedroom New York City apartment, my sister and me. We were looking down at a small suitcase, a black leather box with a metallic frame. She was filled with hope and expectation. I leaned toward doubt. My assignment would be to each day, three times a day, take out the glass bulb attached to the battery and flip the switch. My sister Claire, age 30, had just moved in with me. It was April, seven months after her initial surgery to remove a malignant brain tumor. But she was not yet out of the woods. The post-surgery radiologi radiologist report was inaccurate, and as a result, she missed out on several months of follow-up chemo. She was not supposed to continue living alone, so she bravely transferred her position as a commodities broker in San Francisco to the same company in New York. She was determined to continue to work and be in life as much as possible. Her only other option was to move back in with mom and dad. Very soon after, we got a call from our dad that she was immediately to come to Detroit, where my parents lived, to see Dr. Ivan Stranovich, the only man they believed who could help save her life. There was a sense of authority in my dad's voice, overlaid on a hint of pleading. Everything, everything was arranged, 
For my dad, it was a good plan because he trusted the man who had referred the doctor to him. I was pretty sure that my father, a physician himself, was acting out of desperation, but I didn't say that. I finally met Dr. S. when my sister returned to New York with her mother a week or so later. His clothing appeared disheveled, and to me, he looked a little shady. Nothing about him inspired my confidence. Later that day, I asked if I could speak with him privately. I wanted to quiz him as to his motives and to know just exactly how the electromagnetic waves from the box would have a healing effect. His responses were calm and convincing. They disarmed me. Of course I believed in psychic energy and electromagnetic fields. I thought, what if I were wrong about Dr. S? What if he were for real? And what real harm could he do, even if he were a quack? All medical protocols for Claire at Sloan Kettering Memorial Hospital would continue. And Dr. S had only asked to be reimbursed for expenses. That made him seem more honorable, not a quack trying to get rich quick on nothing. Back at the hotel, my mother and sister both were delirious. My mother for the giddy time she was having with the very brilliant doctor, and my sister for her declaration to me that she had fallen in love with him. This was only one week after they had met. I was also appalled by Claire's reports of playing footsie with the good doctor under the dinner table in Detroit. And, and, by, <laughs> and by the description my mother provided of him as a genius of a man with countless inventions involved in everything from medicine to auto turbo engines. Alarms went off in my head. I feared this could all be a setup. I started wondering when the other shoe would drop. But what could I fault him for at this point, really? In the short time since meeting Dr. Ivan Stranovich, Claire's revival of energy was well near miraculous. Walking, once arduous for her, now came easily. Her spirits, once dimmed by fear and anxiety, were now full of hope because Dr. S had come into our lives with his magic black box the box with the electromagnetic bulb, the magic wand that he claimed would reverse her cancer. I was the one who was going to be administering the correct treatments three times a day. It was in my room, the living room, that the electromagnetic ritual took place. I opened the box, took out the fist-sized bulb, and flipped the switch. The bulb emitted a buzzing blue-black light as I rubbed it over the area of Claire's beautiful, hairless, perfectly egg-shaped head where the tumor was. Periodically during the treatments, the, the device produced a little snapping and crunching sound, like summer patio lamps when they catch and zap an unsuspecting bud, bug. Claire insisted the bulb on her head felt soothing and cooling. And despite my skepticism, each time the world slipped away and I experienced oceans of love and compassion for my sweet sister and her predicament. Ivan Stranovich returned to visit New York more than once that summer. He stayed in my apartment and slept in my sister's bed. It bothered me, but she was a grown woman. At one point when they were apart, she had felt so head over heels, she took my hardcover dictionary, snipped out the word caress with its definition and pasted it into a letter to him. 
Then in late summer, when Claire and I returned from Paris for what might be a last hurrah visit, Yvonne declared that he wanted his black box returned so he could perform some repairs on it. Alarm bells went off for me again. Maybe this was the drop of the other shoe I feared would come. So what the hell has he got up his sleeve now? I protested in a snooty tone of voice. That is when Claire announced that she had invested $5,000, her entire life savings, in his auto turbo engine invention. She blurted out that she had trusted her life with him, so why shouldn't she trust him with her money? We returned the box in the mail as per his request, but predictably, it was not ever sent back as agreed. When our dad finally caught up with Yvonne by phone, he pleaded that the box be returned for her sake, not because he believed anymore that it was a great miracle worker, but because she did. Yvonne asked, then replied, what do you want from me? I cannot turn water into wine. He was not ever seen or heard from again. From that point onward, Claire started to decline. Eventually, she slipped into a coma. When she awoke, she had lost the last 12 years of her recent memory. She could not remember the doctor's name or anything that had happened with him. Her death came four months later of a stage four glioblastoma at the age of 31. Six months later, and just out over a year after he disappeared, the Detroit Free Press published an article about the fate of Dr. S. He was sentenced to a year in jail, a $5,000 fine, and possible deportation. He pleaded guilty to the charge of traveling interstate as a scheme to defraud, and he admitted to the court that he had no more than an eighth grade education. Over time, I've come to understand that if I had spoken up, Claire might never have had those moments of buoyancy and delight. And although there are still times when I wish I could have done more or been better, I have no regrets whatsoever about those excruciatingly sweet moments when I bonded with her over the magic box and the bulb with the blue-black light. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Vamp first timer, Roberta Canto. <laughs> New Orleans is like Un, is unlike any other city I've been to during my travelers as a street performer. As soon as you end up there, the city becomes you. It's the type of place that lives and breathes a story you can't make up, even if you tried. I met Zach when I returned to the city for the third time to type poetry as the typewriter troubadour. For the past several years, I have traveled the country composing custom poetry on my typewriter for curious pedestrians. Sitting next to Zach on the infamous Poets Row, I quickly recognized him as a one-of-a-kind character amid a slew of other street poets. Awaiting our next muse, I gathered it had been a rough month for Zach. Between puffs of sticky rolled cigarettes, he told me he had recently moved to New Orleans from Oregon on the suggestion from another traveling poet named Shannon. Zach took a leap of faith and moved down to the Big Easy, but so far, the transition had been anything but easy. Stolen bikes, slashed tires, run-ins with cops, housing difficulties, distant and difficult love interests, typewriter territory wars, obnoxious frat boys who are more interested in heckling poets than the poetry itself. I wouldn't have been surprised to see Zach's glasses fog up under his wild swath of premature gray hair from all his huffing and puffing. Doomsday commentary seemed to inspire him. 
Still, despite his setbacks, Zack was a good guy, one who considered himself pragmatically optimistic. The type of guy who would bring bags of hot sugar-laced beignets from Café du Monde to feed the hungry poets. The type who would gladly give out cigarettes to bums outside of Rouse's market. The type who would hang off exposed pipes in a humorous attempt to match the zoo-like energy of, this, of the French Quarter. <laughs> and he was a damn good poet. What impressed me most was how his fingers would fly furiously across the keys of his well-loved Royal Mercury whenever he was the chosen poet for hire. However, as soon as someone left with the poem, Zach would drop back into his complaint du jour. One day, the icing on the cake was that this was the year that would be his first year away from his family on his birthday. In New Orleans, a city where streets shut down for makeshift parades, Zach decided to throw a party for himself at the new house he recently moved into. After a series of failed situations, this one seemed promising. It was a classic, unkempt, narrow shotgun with peeling blue paint located on the outskirts of the infamous French Quarter, where cheap rent attracted a colorful cast of characters. Painters, poets, street musicians, potheads, misfits, here, Zach had high hopes for curating an artist collective out of other displaced creatives. I arrived at the party before sunset with a case of cheap beer on my hip, opened a rusty white iron gate adorning dozens of strands of Mardi Gras beads, and followed people's voices to the backyard. The sighting showcased a debaucherous swirl of finger paint from a party of the past, and out back a half dozen people sat in lawn chairs under a makeshift canopy. By the neighboring fence was a tiny house with a sign reading Michelangelo's Lair. And to the right, an above ground pool looked inviting in the swampy spring heat. Zach was the man of the night, dressed in his signature paisley polyester shirt, his frizzy gray hair flailing behind him as he came up to greet me with a squeeze. His charm burnt bright, and just like on Poets Row, it was obvious he enjoyed being the center of attention. I soon spotted Eric, another poet from the row. Perpetually inebriated, he stumbled in with a swagger. His pants hung low, hoodie tied tight, and in his dark hands he held a hot steaming box of fried chicken from Hank's. <laughs> Hank's chicken is the best. <laughs> he set the box of chicken down on the table as four hands flew in, tearing the box to shreds, licking grease-soaked salty fingers in gluttonous delight. Then the musician sauntered in, ready to play, still inspired from an afternoon of busking in the French Quarter. The sweet southern lilt of gypsy jazz, guitars, banjos, clarinets, and bongos filled the sky with the collective soul New Orleans is known for. A couple took off their clothes and slipped into the pool. The party had officially started. <laughs> the next familiar face to arrive was Shannon, I had met her years before on my first stint on Poets Row. Her green eyes lit up with a surprise to see me, and she took me into a sticky southern embrace. A true sweetheart, Shannon had brought supplies to bake Zach a cake. I joined her in the kitchen. But just as the oven was warmed, the eggs cracked and the batter beat, a kid from the party burst in through the back door, shouting that the neighbor's house was on fire. Like, really on fire. Shannon and I rushed outside. Screams of sirens and billows of black smoke filled the sky. Flames were quickly devouring the walls of the house. Shannon stood silently, her green eyes aglow as she meditated on the flames. Soon, Zach, Eric, and the rest of the party came out to watch the spectacle. Well, everything else seems to have burned to the ground this week, Zach exclaimed in reference to his own misfortunes. <laughs> Perhaps he secretly wished it was his own house for the sake of the story. Three fire trucks arrived, silenced their sirens, and began to unleash hoses the size of boa constrictors to battle the flames. Yet, despite their efforts, it was clear that there was no saving this house. A small neighborhood crowd had gathered on the sidewalk, already starting to fuel the gossip train. One person said the building had been abandoned for months 
and it had likely been sparked by a faulty wire. Another said the fire started to due to the old fell asleep with a cigarette narrative carried out by one of the alleged squatters. And one woman said it was straight up arson, the last booyah of a fiery feud. A breeze was starting to blow embers towards the tree branches that lined the wooden fence of Zach's house. Then, I remembered the cake. I was fairly certain I had turned off the oven, but something told me to check, just in case. How ironic would it be if two houses caught on fire the same night, but for completely different reasons? I returned to the kitchen and sighed in relief. The oven was indeed off. The cake was still raw on the rack. I almost turned the oven back on, but I heard yelps from the backyard. Zach's backyard neighbor, Michelangelo, had arrived home from work and wasn't exactly thrilled with the chaos that threatened his tiny house. Embers and ash from the blaze had floated up and over the fence, singeing the leaves of his beloved shade tree. Others had landed on his roof. Here, young man, he said with a thick Jamaican accent, running around the pool and throwing a tangled hose at me. We must wet everything. Michelangelo's white teeth flashed in the light of the fire, shouting out obscenities. His hands flew up to his forehead, long dreads trembling. We struggled to untangle the hose together and stretched it out as far as it would go, but it still wasn't long enough. Another guy had returned with some small buckets. He handed them to me as Michelangelo continued to try to work out the kinks in the hose. Here, fill these, he barked. I ran back inside the main house to fill the buckets in the kitchen, frantically unloading dirty dishes from the sink. The faucet was running slow, so I darted across the hall to the bathroom with the second bucket to fill it in the bathtub. Back in the kitchen, one of the stoners had wandered in from watching the fire. He dipped a finger into the leftover cake batter and brought it to his lips dumbly. I thrust a bucket at him. Fill this and bring it outside, I commanded. I grabbed the first bucket from the kitchen sink and ran out to grab the second from the tub and hobbled back outside, splashing each against the wooden fence that separated Zach's property from the one being eaten by flames. Michelangelo had finally untangled a clear line on the hose. The water pressure was weak, but he sprayed the branches and wet whatever he could of his home. The fence, the roof, the siding. And all the while, he muttered prayers from underneath his breath as if to summon the water gods. I started to head back inside to fill a second round as the stoner sloshed past me with his bucket. Our efforts seemed futile. Each bucket had emptied faster than we could refill it. Meanwhile, the fire was spreading. We needed a lot more water and fast. Michelangelo was now rambling even louder as if to ward off the prophecy of the devil's inferno. He held the hose nozzle like a gun. This is holy water! Holy water indeed! You see, we must wet everything! The roof! Spray. The trees! Spray. The fence! Spray. The ground! Spray. Everything! We cannot see how far the embers fly. Michelangelo was a pretty smart guy, and soon others arrived to add to the effort. Shannon returned as an angel or a genius, noting the obvious detail that the men missed amid the hysteria. Instead of running back and forth into the house, she suggested we fill our buckets in the pool. <laughs> Duh. Adrenaline pumping, I was glad to see people getting it together to work as a team. We ran back and forth, dunking each bucket in the pool again and again, creating a current of energy. Perhaps we could save Michelangelo's lair. Eventually, everything seemed like it was going to be okay. The last hiss of smoke kissed the blackened sky as the firefighters started to retract their hoses. The house was toast, but for them, it was just another day at the office. Back in Zach's yard, the party was in complete disarray. Michelangelo had taken his water blessings above and beyond, turning over every chair and canopy. He had succeeded in protecting his property. Everything was drenched. After the high of the fire died down, we got back to celebrating Zach's birthday. 
Shannon had finished baking the cake and presented it to him covered with candles as the musicians broke out into a sultry vamp of happy birthday. Zach blew out the candles, making a wish with a smile that burned brighter than the fire itself. Knowing him, he was probably pleased that such drama had gone down on his special day. <laughs> Perhaps even in his honor. That is another vamp first timer, Dan Brown. I felt the needle dig into my skin as it carved inked on the inside of my right arm. It was the second tattoo that I ever got, and it hurt. It hurt much more than my first one, which was two simple words, without fear, in Spanish, on my inner left wrist. It shouldn't surprise me. The second tattoo was larger than the first one, so of course there would be pain. The outline of the tattoo hurt bad enough on the inside of my right arm, but nothing prepared me for the colors being shaded in. But the tattoo artist had already started, and it was too late to turn back now. So what's the story behind your tattoo? She asked me. Her name was Jenna. She was my age, and already I could tell she had more life experience than I ever did. Like any tattoo artist, she was covered from almost from her recently buzz cut head to her toes in colorful art. But what stood out the most to me was her kind, soulful brown eyes and her positive outlook in life as we chatted beforehand. I cringed in pain as she moved the tattoo gun again. What inspired it, she asked me. I looked over and watched her glide the needle into my skin as the tattoo gun buzzed quietly. It all started with a panic attack 17 years ago, my very first one to be exact. I was a senior in high school and had finished shopping with my mother at a nearby mall. Neither of us had a car or knew how to drive. We had taken the bus hours earlier and while we sat waiting, I noticed I felt a little strange. I couldn't figure out what, but then I started feeling sick. Then two words suddenly popped into my head. What if? These two words are powerful magic. They can conjure any type of world inside your mind that is so vivid and so clear, you are convinced that it's happening. Well, that's exactly what happened to me. These thoughts, came rushing into my mind. What if you start feeling sick on the bus and you throw up everywhere? My mind suddenly reeled. What if you do get sick on the bus and then they have to stop and you ruin everyone's night? What if, what if it confused and scared me? My heart started pounding in my chest. My breathing was fast. I felt out of control or maybe I was losing my mind. I promptly broke into tears. I told my mother I couldn't get onto the bus. I was too scared. Something was wrong with me. This, of course, worried my mother, but she did her best to comfort me during a time where I was unable to feel any comfort. We ended up waiting three hours until my sister got off from work to come pick us up at the mall. Once we got home, my mother made me some chamomile tea to help calm me down. I had calmed down somewhat, but I still felt shaken by my own body's reaction to the panic inside my mind. It was a horrible and ugly feeling that made me feel as if I were a mouse trapped in a corner by some invisible cat. Little did I know how those feelings of panic would change the course of my life forever. Everyone says that your early 20s is the time where you go out and explore the world, get your shit figured out, and become the person you're supposed to be. Sadly for me, I never got the chance to explore the world or get my shit together during my early 20s because it was met with an unexpected and quick death by agoraphobia. This type of anxiety disorder is when someone develops f a fear of places or situations that might cause panic, feeling helpless, or embarrassment. Once I felt that first feeling of panic, that flight or fight mode that our ancestors give it, gave us, it stayed with me and it affected my life. The anxiety got worse and worse when my mother had gotten sick 
once again with breast cancer after the first discovery had been dealt with. My siblings and I thought our mother had beaten it after chemotherapy, losing our hair, and having gone through a mastectomy. However, the cancer came back. This time, the bitch decided to make itself home in my mother's pancreas. This time, we knew this was serious. My mother went through chemo again, and since she rarely spoke English, let alone understand much of it, I had gone with her to help translate and keep her company during her treatments. But the more I went with her, the more anxious I got on the car on the way to the clinic. That feeling, those thoughts overwhelmed me again, giving me doubt and fear. Only this time, my anxiety was about getting anxiety. What if that feeling comes back? What if I lose control of myself like last time? The anxiety became too much that I eventually was unable to leave my home. I became agoraphobic when I was 20 years old. My mother lost her battle with cancer two years later. I guess at the time, it made sense that I would be the one taking care of my elderly father since I was the one who was at home all the time, albeit not by choice. My father had suffered a heart attack, and while in recovery at the hospital, he had a small stroke that affected his ability to walk, but not his speech. We both became invalids at home, both of us unable to walk out and be around people while the rest of our family went to work, school, and the grocery store, you know, all the normal, everyday things people do. My sister took care of the shopping, bills, and my dad's doctor's appointments, and I stayed home and took care of the house. It was during this time that uh, a friend of mine gave me my first hit of a drug. Books. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I became addicted to books. She had given me books as Christmas and birthday gifts after I told her of feeling trapped at home. She gave me books to escape my anxiety and the boredom in my life. But it wasn't enough. I couldn't wait another year for my next hit. I needed them now, so I went and found myself a better dealer. I, f <laughs> I found a local library that could mail books to me. It, it was genius. <laughs> the Books by Mail program catered to people who lived either too far away from a library or for medical disability reasons were unable to go to a library. That was me. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> And with each book, I would stay up late at night, devouring them as I whispered to myself, one more chapter, just, just one more chapter. <laughs> My love for books became a source of comfort. It didn't matter what book it was. A book would help ground me, distract me whenever I felt the panic rise. With every book I read, I left my anxiety behind me. I traveled, I time traveled. I solved crimes with Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> I went on a horrific Transylvanian adventure with Professor Van Helsing. <laughs> yeah. I started a revolution with the girl on fire. Mm -hmm. I fought alongside with Harry Dresden, the only wizard in the phone book in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I learned magic in Hogwarts and I learned to survive the vast wasteland of Mars with a botanist. I did all this without moving my feet. The books I read gave me comfort of knowing that no matter who you are, where you're from, what struggles you might have, you're not alone. It gave me a sense of strength and a sense of perseverance that I had not felt within myself since the time I experienced that first panic attack. When I was 26 years old, my father died. This time I had no choice but to join the real world after six years of being unable to leave my home. As I got a better handle of my anxiety and agoraphobia through therapy, I ventured out more and more. I made myself take walks around the neighborhood, pushing myself to go farther away from my home. I remember the first time I tried to leave. I set a goal for myself to walk down the street to a lamppost and walk back home. With my heart pounding, my breathing fast, I was able to do it. For some people, this is an easy task to do, but for me, it was the hardest thing I had to do at that time. 
I did this over and over for weeks until I was able to go farther and farther down the street. Later on, I made myself get into a car with my sister to go to the grocery store. I remember the first time getting onto the bus to start my day when I went to college. I was terrified and there were some bumps along the way with my anxiety, but I made it. Some days I didn't make it, other times I didn't, but I didn't give up. I was trying to teach my brain that there was no need to panic. I didn't need to be in fight or flight mode. Slowly but surely, the anxiety and panic became less and less. Eventually, I volunteered at a local library, which led me to a job working there. I went back to college and eventually got my BA in English, thanks to my one constant companion throughout this time. <laughs> books. My love for books is the reason and gave me the inspiration to be a writer. Wow, that is amazing for you to come through that, I heard the tattoo artist say as she finished my tattoo with the last bit of color. It is a book laid open with its pages flying up as magical mist floated above it with the words carpe librum, meaning seize the book, in Latin were written right below it. You need to tell your story, she said. You never know, people could relate and not feel alone. Now, isn't that the point of books and why we tell stories? They are reminders of no matter who you are, what you went through, you are not alone. We're all stories in the end, a doctor with a magical blue box once said. Just make it a good one. Would you believe it's another VAMP first timer? Nubia Chavez! Day one, I meet Tim at a bar. We connect like two wires in a bomb in an explosion of intimacy and lust, an alcohol-fueled act of hedonistic rebellion. In the morning, I'm embarrassed. My parents taught me I shouldn't do certain things, like have a one-night stand. When Tim and I agree to go on a real date, I'm eager because of well, the sex, and also because if we have sex again, my one-night stand will no longer be a one-night stand. <laughs> Day six, Tim wants to be exclusive. Mission accomplished. We clink our vodka tonics and smile. More amazing sex follows. I am a paradox, born to a deadbeat dad I never knew and a paranoid schizophrenic mom. Then, in the sixth grade, I met Mrs. Ferguson, my teacher. She and her husband took me in and adopted me out of foster care. The only way I'm not paralyzed by the polarity of my nature and nurture is to let my instincts be the current I follow. I have lived most of my life trying to live up to an ideal, to prove I deserved to be rescued and can be a daughter that makes my parents proud. With his dark hair, blue eyes, and super fit physique, Tim is my idea of the perfect mate. We talk about the future, we work out together, we love the same music, his mouth tastes delicious, like danger, smoke, and liquor. He is my attempt to be less uptight, to give in and let myself be carried out to sea. Day 62, I accompany Tim to Colorado to help his friend Paul move back to California. The idea is to fly there and drive home in Paul's truck. On the airplane, I turned down a tiny bottle of vodka. I've never had alcohol on a plane before, another thing I was taught I shouldn't do, something only alcoholics do. <laughs> Tim isn't counting cocktails. He's throwing cash at the flight attendant like she's the lead stripper at a club. <laughs> he is getting completely plastered. 
my fear kicks in. Will I need to take care of him? Will he be able to take care of me? I don't like how strange and insecure this feels. Am I safe? My biological mom drank and smoked and tried to kill me. She tried to stab herself to death while my brother and I watched. After she moved out of the house we shared with my grandparents, I found an empty bottle of Popov and an ax under the chair in her room. Watching Tim's one-man airplane party is both triggering and intriguing. Do I even know how to have a good time? Am I made of anxiety and shame, trying too hard to be good, but always tired of feeling like I have to hold it together for everyone else? A wave of anxiety crashes over me. I press my temple to the window and breathe, watching the black night through the glass, trying my best to believe everything is going to be okay. The next night in Colorado, we go to a dive bar. I love the, the low lights and neon signs the walls and floors emit the aromatic yet dirty scent of old beer that is somehow both visceral reminder of the past and a hopeful promise for the future. Tim is flirty. He grabs me. I relax in the seduction, wanting to be the center of attention. The night swirls through me. We are young and free. Maybe it's the buzz. Maybe it's the music so loud I can no longer feel my body, only the rhythm. When I'm with Tim, my spirit is wild and understood. He tames me and sets me free at the same time. Back at the apartment, Tim and Paul go out to the balcony to smoke. They don't care that it's 30 degrees outside. I pretend not to care, even though being this cold stirs something inside of me. The terrifying loneliness I had when my mom believed spies were after us and she forced us to roam the streets and sleep in parks. I try to find the logic in my anxiety. My fear is a psychosomatic freezing that makes me hypervigilant, ready to protect myself. Once the cold gets inside my bones, it never leaves. I need some water. I already had my whiskey. <laughs> Back at the apartment, Tim and Paul go out to the balcony to smoke. They don't care that it's 30 degrees outside. I pretend not to care, even though being this cold stirs something inside of me. The terrifying loneliness I had when my mom believed spies were after us and she forced us to roam the streets and sleep in parks. Paul offers me a cigarette. I take it, feeling like I'm betraying myself. Like by smoking this cigarette, I'm trading my true self for an ironic, romanticized version. But maybe this is who I really am. Tim takes drag after drag and effortlessly exhales. I want him to put his arms around me, to care more about me than about blowing rings of smoke into the night. As I inhale, the heat and nicotine rumble in my throat. I cough. I smoked my first cigarette when I was eight. I loved the first burn, but hated the inhale. I won't become a smoker. My parents would never approve. They have sacrificed so much for me, I can't repay them by becoming a smoker. But what's one cigarette? It feels amazing to be alive even when I'm shivering and inexplicably on the verge of tears. Tim and Paul don't notice how alone I feel. I could leap from the railing, and the most they would say is, wow, that was weird. <laughs> Once back inside, Tim and I sit on the love seat. He and Paul pop the tabs on their natty lights. Tim opens his laptop. Out of the corner of my eye, I see his MySpace profile pic. It's of him and some girl mid makeout. Their tongues are in each other's mouths. She's smiling slightly and, you know, saying, fuck you, Leslie. <laughs> I want that picture to be of me and Tim, but we don't even have any photos of us. I tell myself, be cool, but I can't help it. That Tim isn't even trying to hide the photo makes me want to scream. Who is that? 
I pull away so I can look him in the eyes. Nobody, Tim says. When I tell him she doesn't look like nobody, he says, it's my ex. No big deal. Get over it. The argument builds. I ask him to explain, to see this from my perspective. He tells me I'm too controlling. I pour myself a vodka tonic to take my mind off of that girl's tongue in my boyfriend's mouth. I'm in my own private hell where I imagine them naked together. Imagining Tim, imagining her naked, on top of her, in love with her, about to propose to her after telling her what a jealous freak I am. I bought a goddamn plane ticket to Colorado for this guy? My throat tightens. I feel sick to my stomach. I go to bed angry, yet hoping Tim will follow me and agree he should delete the photo, hoping we can get back to being us. I wait and wait. After what feels like hours, Tim comes into the room. Without a word, he vanishes into the bathroom. A rush of water into the bathtub. Are you taking a bath? I call out. No response. Man, he must be really drunk. Then panic sits in. I think about how I found my biological mom sitting in a tub of bloody water the morning after she tried to kill herself. He can't be in there about to end it all because we fought over a stupid photo. I'm sorry about the photo, I say. Please come out. I press my ear to the door and hear only the glass-like plunk of intermittent droplets falling into water. I knock. Are you OK? I jiggle the doorknob. Locked. Tim? Nothing. I shake the door by the knob. If you're mad, let's talk. Let me in. Nothing. I go back to bed, but can't sleep. Not with my boyfriend having passed out in the bathtub and possibly drowning while I just sit here. Not with him slitting his wrists or doing God knows what in there. I consider getting Paul to break the door down. But the apartment is cold and quiet, ticking in the witching hour. Eventually, I drift off to sleep. I wake to a ray of daytime streaming in through the blinds. The bathroom door is still closed. I shake sleep from my hair, wipe the grit from my eyes, and stumble to the door. Maybe Tim died in there and I let it happen. I knock hard and fast. Tim? He busts out like a werewolf freed from its chains. His brow is furrowed, mouth drawn down. <laughs> Hey, are you OK? He ignores me, throws his belongings into his duffel. It's as if this is who he really is, a blackout drunk. We don't talk for the rest of the day, though I'm desperate to apologize and resolve the conflict so I can breathe again. Tim, Paul, and I load the trailer in preparation for the 17-hour drive. We leave, and I sit in the back seat, flanked by duffels, pillows, and boxes. After dark, we pull off the road to grab dinner. Back at the truck, Tim says I can have the front seat. I want to talk. I take hold of his hand, but he slips away from me and climbs into the back. I wish I would have taken a cab to the airport the night before, but for some reason, I always stay too long. I need to be better at recognizing when I'm not wanted and I need to want better things, better people. When Tim passes out, I ask Paul about the previous night. Trust me, he says, it's not you, it's him. This makes me feel marginally better. Once Tim and I are in his car on the way to my place, we don't talk. I keep waiting for him to say something. 45 minutes into the two hour drive, Tim says he thinks we should break up. I say, actually, I've been thinking the same thing. It's a lie, but I know I don't want to be with someone who drinks himself into oblivion and locks me out of the bathroom only to fall asleep in his own bathwater. I don't want to be with someone who scares me like my mom did. A life with Tim would be spent cleaning up messes and second guessing myself about clearing away empty bottles, hiding sharp objects, and begging for love and attention. I fight back tears for the rest of the drive. When we arrive, Tim comes in to use the restroom. I pull a picture of him from my bulletin board, 
the only picture I have of him, one in which he is not making out with another girl. <laughs> he says, thanks, I wanted that back. I say, see how easy it is to take down a picture? My voice shakes, but I'm proud of myself. Tim leaves. I lock the door behind him. Maybe I can have safety or passion, but not both. I crumble onto my bed to cry him out of me. I think about why it hurts so much to lose someone I've known for only a short time. Tim is fire, and I am air. I'm supposed to focus on my future, where I can float safely instead of dwelling on the past where I only add fuel to things that burn too hot. My throat is still raw from that damn cigarette, but I can feel my sense of self-worth emerging as if from the ashes of my relationship. Throats heal, and so do hearts. Day 96. Tim calls, saying he made a mistake. He wants to get back together. <laughs> Let's just have coffee and talk, he says. I don't want to get back together with you, I say. My voice is strong and sure. Perhaps for the first time in my life, I don't try to defend myself or beg for an explanation. The new me knows Tim can't give me what I need. Tim was my drug, but I sobered up and broke that habit. I now know who I am, and I've come too far to go back. Yeah. Leslie Ferguson! Were you not entertained? <laughs> you guys have been a great audience. Want to give a special thank you to the Whistle Stop here, to Joaquin and Drew, and also to you guys. You have been amazing. Thank you so much. Want to say a uh, shout out to our volunteers, Eber, Jennifer, Brent, Adam, and Killian, and to our coaches, Jennifer, Leo, Brandy, David, Kelly, and Anastasia. Uh, Anastasia. Once more for tonight's performers, Anastasia, Kirsten, An Anna, Dallas, Roberta, JM, Nubia, and Leslie. Thank you and good night. Please stay with us. Enjoy the whistle stop. <laughs>